Hello. Thank you. I feel like uh, I feel like I should apologize that I can't speak French, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so okay, so today we're going to be talking about automating uh, the modern data center. Um, so I think it's unlikely. I'm hoping it's unlikely, but uh, this is. I did give this talk last week in Amsterdam. So if you were in Amsterdam last week, you might have seen this. Um, so I apologize, but I don't. I don't think that's likely. Um, I got an introduction, but if you want to, you know, send questions, you should actually send it with the automation day hashtag. But uh, if you want to send it to me, that's fine as well, and I'll uh, answer separately. Um, as I said, I, I started a company called HashiCorp. Um, we build um, these five tools currently. Um, there's another one coming soon, but uh, currently it's these five. So Vagrant, Packer, Surf, Console, and Terraform. Uh, I'm the main designer, creator of those five things. Um, for the purpose of this talk, um, kind of had to narrow it down because you know I could give sort of an hour talk about each of these, um, and I wanted to condense it and really talk more generally about like how to automate the data center and the, the problems we're trying to solve more so than how we do it specifically with one thing. Um, especially because in the afternoon, I'm going to give a demo. Um, so uh, in the afternoon, we'll dive a lot more into technical details about uh, more of these. So for this talk, actually what I want to talk about is the bottom two here, which is console and Terraform. And the reason I picked these two out was because um, as we're talking about the data center, I wanted to talk more about the production side of the, of the data center, more so than, de than the development side. Um, but feel free sort of afterwards to ask me questions about the development side if you want to. Um, and, and sort of throughout this talk, there's some slides that have a lot of details. And depending on time, I might just skip over them because we could go over them in the workshop if you're interested. Um, but I want to make sure to get the high level concepts sort of out of the way. Uh, so first off, uh, the modern data center. And, um, when, when I say the modern data center, uh, I mean a very specific thing. So uh, I don't mean it in the, in, in the general sense of the, the data center of today or tomorrow. Um, when I say the modern data center, I'm sort of using a specific definition that I like to think about. And so I just want to describe that today. Um, so to, to start off, we're going to go back to the very, very, very basics and go through it quickly. So obviously, everyone knows this. Um, single server, very easy life. You know easy to do things. Then you start getting into multiple servers. So this is you know, still you know, a decade ago. Um, very simple. Um, virtualization came along. Things get a little bit more complex. You know, more distributed systems, more, more complex networking, um, image issues, other things. You, know, you get a lot more things coming in here. Um, still about a decade ago, uh, or depending where your company is and that migration. Um, and then, of course, Jerome just talked. And I couldn't understand his talk, but uh, I'm sure it was about containers. So uh, yeah, you know, obviously containers uh, are now extremely popular, and you have to think about them. Um, and there's a variety of ways you run them, you know, directly on a server, within a VM, um, with a VM, but ne uh, side by side to a VM. You know, there's a lot, it, it adds a lot of complexity um, to everything, but there's a lot of benefits as well. And so this is sort of where we're at today. But then the sort of next step that I take things when I define something as the modern data center um, is this thing. So um, on the left, you know, these servers might have VMs and containers. I just couldn't fit that many little boxes. So imagine there's a ton of containers and VMs over here. Um, but the important thing is on the right, there's also more and more services. So um, when I try to think about how do we automate the data center today, and then also how do we automate it? You know, how do we make sure we're building tools that not only could automate it today, but could automate it five years from now or 10 years from now? Uh, this is really what I think about with actually a lean towards the right. Um, because you know, if you go back 10 years, the amount of software as a service or the amount of your core data center facilities that were running as software as a service um, were maybe zero or one, like maybe DNS. But um, you might actually be, if you're a big enough company, you're definitely running that yourself too. So um, you know, it was about zero. You, there was no real software as a service uh, uh, for your data center. And nowadays, it's it's very much on the other end, there's a lot of software as a service. And some of it isn't very practical yet at, at a certain scale. Like uh, a reasonably sized company generally won't use a database as a service. They'll run it in-house still. But you know, more and more core things are almost always now software as a service. DNS, um, CDNs, more and more like things like load balancers. Um, these things that are core to your data center. Your data center cannot run without them. 
are now being pushed off to services. And I only think that this trend is going to continue. So as, as sort of you know, years go on, um, what someone once told me was basically, you know, there's, there's no future with less servers. And that's completely true. And I'm not fighting that at all. Uh, but as we go into the future, there will be more and more servers that we don't control, despite the growth in servers. So while you'll always have this on the left, and you'll always have to run some servers, you're also going to have more and more services. So when I think about building tools for the future, it's really, uh, for me, the interest is, well, every company needs to manage services as well as servers, not just servers. So um, that's sort of how we think about tools going forward. And, and you'll see how this comes into play in both console and Terraform. So here's really the choices you have in a data center today. Um, you know, it's public cloud, private cloud, physical, virtual containers, um, the various as-a-service things. There's infrastructure as a service like EC2. Um, there's platform as a service like Heroku. Um, and there's software as a service like Cloudflare or uh, uh, even Akamai and things like that. Um, then there's operating systems. Operating systems are actually you know, the easiest thing to mo homogenize, usually. Like, you could get your full data center Linux. That's not actually too difficult. It's the most likely of all these to be homogenized. Um, but at, in, you know, I'm still going into a lot of companies where even though they're 99% uh, Linux, they still have like the three Windows machines running Active Directory or something in the corner or Exchange. And so like, it's, it's still a mix of everything. And so realistically, when it, what I'm seeing is that a lot of companies just have a mix of everything. And that makes sense because um, you know, the Saying you're homogenous, saying your data center is homogenous, is saying that you never want it to change. Like you chose a, sl a slice of time where you chose all the best technologies for that period of time, and you picked those. So, like if ten years ago, if you said your data center was homogenous, it might be, uh, let's say it's Linux-based. So it was homogenous Linux with uh, VMware installed on top of it, um, and you just had VMs that were all the same. Like that would be homogenous. But that, if you were homogenous today, that means you're ignoring containers. That means you're ignoring new operating systems. Um, and if you're saying you're homogenous and you are adopting those, it means you're able to adopt them in binary. You're able to go from 100% what you had before to 100% container sort of in one switch, and that's unlikely too. So sort of inevitably during the process of adopting something new, um, you're heterogeneous um, and perhaps you're homogenous for a period of time. But then when we talk about a you know, post-Docker world or whatever's next, post-containerization, I should say, world, um, then there's inevitably some years from now going to be another period of heterogeneity. Um, in order to get back to a homogenous infrastructure. So again, when I think about modern data center, um, I think about periods of stability, periods of chaos when new technologies come out, and also this idea that more and more things are going to be services. And then you want to manage all of that without having to change your tooling. Um, that's really the core of how I think about tool design, um, software design for automating the modern data center. So this is complicated. Um, but, but why is it complicated? Um, Actually, it's funny. The first talk, I like, couldn't get the slides to change, and I keep changing two at a time. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, why is all this stuff complicated? And the reason is because we want to make things efficient. We want we want to deploy applications faster. We want to uh, you know get more stable you know development production environments. You know what Jerome talked about uh, as as much as I could read his slides. Um, and so all these new technologies come out. They're not meant to make it more complicated. They're meant to solve real problems, and they do solve real pro problems, um, but at the cost of sort of slightly higher management <laughs> complexity. But that cost is worth it um, because they're solving so many problems. So when I think about how do we go from development to production, this is sort of how I break things down. Um, and when I and this is a very general thing, but I think that you know whether you're talking about containers or whatever language you're talking about. Or you could go back sort of 10 years, and this is still applicable. And I think it'll still be applicable sort of 10 years from now, too. I'm trying to build like a general map of how things go. This is sort of how I see it. There's sort of three phases. Maybe they're one team. Maybe they're separate teams. I'm not trying to say anything about that. But there's sort of three phases. that You start in development. There are some properties you want in development. You do deployment, which requires you to bring up servers or containers or VMs or anything. But it requires you to build something that could run your code and probably compile your code and things like that. So that's deployment. And then eventually there's maintenance, which is your application is deployed, but now you want to update it, or now you want to scale it out, or now you want to do some sort of maintenance or do complex you know, orchestration in terms of uh, you know, 100 servers and do things one bit at a time. That's maintenance. And then eventually it just, it just kind of spins around. And you have this constant flow. And I think that all the tools that we build for automation are, when we think about the data center, are purely 
at a technical level about making this faster uh, and faster while not breaking things. Um, so sort of like the first speaker said, you know, move, be agile, but also be stable. So that's really, I think, the technical goals of everything. And that's sort of also how we view things as we design software, which we sort of pick off various problems in the set, um, see where we could do things and try to build a complete story in order to get you there. And that's still in progress. So um, now let's talk about sort of taming this data center, taming this complexity. Um, how do we do it on the deployment and maintenance side, which is what I said I'd focus on for today. So for deployment and maintenance, uh, I break it down into four steps. Um, there's the acquisition step, provision, update, and destroy. Um, and these spin around in a loop. So acquisition is like, give me a server, give me something that could run my code. Uh, provision is, you know, set it up in a way that it's ready to run the code once you have the thing. Um, uh, update is, is deploy something and destroy is obviously destroy. And, and, you know, usually you acquire something, provision and update sort of spin in a, in a tight loop, and then eventually you destroy it. Um, and when people talk about mutable or immutable infrastructure and things like that, it's just sort of how much do you spin two and three? Do you spin those steps? Or is it just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four? Or is it one, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, four? Like, that's all the differences between mutable and immutable. Um, so historically, you know, when we look back, getting servers, you know, acquisition, the acquisition time was days or weeks. The provisioning time was hours or days. You know, acquisition was basically fill out an order form, wait for a box to show up, and then plug it in, and that sort of thing. Provisioning was file a ticket, wait for um, someone somewhere to set something up, maybe manually, maybe automated, but still kind of slow compared to what we could do today. You know, if you look at something like Docker versus something like um, Chef, and not to pick on those two, but you know, Docker starting from a binary image, so it's really fast, and then Chef has to really run through from a sort of stem cell-like image, so it's much, much slower just by nature. Um, you can see how like everything's gotten a lot faster. Um, and SAS in the history that I'm going back didn't really exist for practical purposes. Um, but today, if you look at things, ev all those things are available in minutes or seconds even. Basically, everything has an API. So you could get a server with an API, you could provision things using an API, and you could also get SAS services with an API. You know, I could I could request almost any like almost any SAS service that comes out has an API. So once you have an account and enter billing information, you could basically request those resources. Uh, at a whim, and so everything's moving a lot, lot faster. And the thing is, like, this is faster than any person can reasonably do things. Like, if if you think of how fast it's going, we've passed the point where these all the resources for deployment and maintenance are available just just faster than is ever possible for a person to do it. You just can't type fast enough to make these things happen. So inevitably, sort of, you have to build tools. To, to do it for us, to take advantage of the speed that um, we're given today, we need to write tools to, to do it. So one more step back in time, um, sort of the properties of the data center as I view them prior, is you have a relatively fixed set of servers. You have some small amount of growth and change, but it's slow. Um, there's fewer applications to deploy. You know, SOA has certainly been a thing for forever, but um, we're, we're seeing SOA and the new hip way to say SOA is just microservices. We're seeing them at a um, much earlier stage, so startups are practicing SOA, whereas before SOA was really uh, an enterprise-y thing. Um, so we're seeing that way closer down the line, so you have a lot more applications to deploy. Um, there was fewer SaaS, we've we hit that on the head a, a few times. And then there was less demanding web traffic, and this is a funny one to think about, but there was just, just strictly speaking, 10 years ago there was, you know, I don't actually know the number, but I would say orders of magnitude less internet connected devices, uh, people or not people. So, you know, given that, you just had less traffic. Uh, and nowadays, even smaller startups, like the, the point at which you're a high scale website is, is, is different. Like you would say like a million hits a day would be high scale maybe 10 years ago. But um, I, the last startup I worked for before I started this company, um, was doing sort of like 30,000 API requests per second, and we didn't consider that high scale because they were like machines hitting us, not people. Um, and so there's today, there's, which I should just go to this side. Um, today, there's just more and more internet connected devices that are both people and not people, which leads to higher traffic, which leads to us thinking about scale more and automation more. Um, spinning back up, you know, there's 
servers are a lot more elastic today, we, not just due to APIs, but <laughs> due to what we want. We, we actually want to be able to spin things up and down on demand, and that's actually a big, you know, a big selling point of things like uh, Docker and Mesos and things like that, which is create a homogenous set and of, of general compute and fill in the gaps as you need them. And, and I think that's, that's the, the dream that has existed for years, which is we want this elastic compute cloud. Um, there's a huge push towards SOA, so uh, like I said, at the smallest, you know, smallest stages of startups, a lot more startups are doing service-oriented architecture. Um, not much more to say there, except that that's complicated because instead of deploying one monolithic app that you can make that one deploy process really fantastic, now we have to think about how to deploy a bunch of different services that perhaps have different languages and things like that. Um, and again, that's where something like uh, an image-based format like a container or VM starts to help a lot. SaaS for everything, we already talked about that. Um, so sort of what do we need, in my opinion, what do we need in order to achieve all these goals given the properties of the data center today? And uh, I think we need, you know, we need to go from zero as in like you have code um, and you have, you have a description of how to get things done to fully deployed. Um, we need to be able to do that in one command. Um, and the reason we need to do that in one command is because as the number of applications grows, the number of developers grow and operators grow, um, we need to just keep things fast. The people always need to somehow be faster than the computers. And the way we're faster that by computers is sort of a force multiplier, which is a tool. Um, so we need our tools to be able to do the work for us and get things done in one command. Uh, you need resiliency through distributed systems. So uh, just due to the nature of the data center today, um, everything you're running is more distributed, is, is, generally, is generally distributed than not. Um, so if you, unless you're running everything on one machine, um, like that very first slide I showed, uh, you have some sort of distributed system. So we need to design software to think like that. But also because the data center is getting more elastic, um, if you want your servers to be elastic and you want things to come and go, there is, you can't have a concept of ordering anymore. You have to expect things to fail really quickly and you have to expect when things disappear, it might not necessarily even be a failure. It might be expected. You might have just scaled down the servers. So, you know, when uh, when a web server is talking to a database and suddenly the database's IP changes between requests, so it can't talk to the old one, uh, you can't th that web server can't that web app can't just crash anymore. It has to just recover and get it. Um, but also, the things that are monitoring these things have to be distributed because they might also go down. So you can't it's you can't have this highly scalable elastic data center if there's any one piece in your data center that is, that is not resilient to also being elastic. It makes it a little tricky. So um, as we go forward, I think we need more and more things to be distributed systems, and we need to think that way. Otherwise, I think the non-distributed systems will inevitably fall off um, as the distributed systems that do the identical thing just replace them due to the nature of them being able to be elastic. Um, Auto-scaling, auto-healing, I think we talked about that enough. Um, and then the last one, the codified knowledge is really the key point here. Um, we need to move more and more things to be codified. So uh, there could be less bottlenecks in people in terms of having the one ops person who has the, who knows how all the data center works in their head or how the software works in their head. Uh, more things need to be codified. So this, these are things like infrastructure as code. So basic, like things we've had for years, like configuration management, but bringing it down to sort of things like Terraform, Terraform and console, which is moving more and more how to configure things and how to spin up servers and how to configure services down into code. I did it again. Um, so how? Uh, automation, obviously. So given our tools, I'm just going to briefly mention these top two here. Um, and you know, I'm going to do a deep dive in the afternoon if you're interested. So let's first start by talking about Terraform. So Terraform. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about Terraform is it's the deployment step before maintenance. So I'll just talk about it first. Um, so Terraform's goal in one sentence, what I put on the website, is uh, to build, combine, and launch infrastructure safely and efficiently. So that's great. But practically, like, what does it do? So at a practical thing, this is the thing that Terraform answers for you. Um, if I came to you and asked you to create uh, a complete isolated environment for an application, and that means, you know, all the servers it needs, all the services it needs, all the permissions set up, deployed. How do you do that really quickly? Terraform will do that. Um, how do you deploy or update an existing complex application and communicate to me how that's going to happen? So um, uh, a practical example is if I came to you and said, uh, 
let's just say we're using memcache and for some reason we want to use Redis instead, uh, I, I would say you know switch the application to use Redis also, you know, or to the operator the app's going to use Redis, so we need Redis in the data center. How do you show what's going to happen? Like how do you show a diff of how you do a change to the infrastructure instead of just doing it? Um, and answers that. Uh, this question gets asked in every company at some point, which is basically just on paper somehow, you know, digital or physical paper. Yeah, just put down how is our infrastructure architected? Where are what are the servers? What is network to each other? How do they talk? What talks like does the web server ever talk to this server? That sort of stuff. Um, Terraform can do that, and then and then delegation, and this becomes bigger as as there's more SOA, which is basically delegating ops away to smaller teams. So. Um, what I like to call it is sort of core IT or core ops versus app IT or app ops. So you have your core ops team, which does things like install something like OpenStack and configure networking and configure that really base layer. And then you have the app ops on top of it, which is consuming everything that core ops is doing. So core ops says, here's, here's the address to the highly available Postgres machine that we're going to back up, but you're never going to touch the servers. And we're going to make sure it scales, uh, but you could use it. And AppOps just sort of wants to use it, but also wants to deploy other web servers and use VMs or containers or anything, and they're free to do that. And that's sort of how do you do that separation safely? So uh, Terraform answers these in various ways. Um, and here's how. So Terraform, uh, in sort of five bullet points, is create infrastructure with code. I think that's a very basic way to view Terraform. Um, um, and at its very core, that's sort of what it does, is you describe things with code. But a key difference between Terraform and something like uh, uh, CloudFormation or something like a Docker machine is that it doesn't just create one server or a handful of servers. It also creates software as a service for you and then links them together. And that's a really critical part when you think back to that modern data center thing I was talking about. Because if you're using CloudFormation, you know, you could, if you're all AWS, it works. You could describe everything. Um, but as you move forward, you know, if you have AWS, but as soon as you have all AWS, but then you decide to use Cloudflare for your DNS, CloudFormation is fragmented for you. You could you use CloudFormation for all your infrastructure, but then you have separate scripts or something separate for Cloudflare. Um, so what Terraform does is let you do all the things with AWS, also build up the Cloudflare instance, but, but then say something in code, be able to say, and take the IP address or the DNS of this load balancer, and configure a C name in Cloudflare for me, or something like that. Um, and you can do that across various SaaS providers, you know, email providers, databases, et cetera. Um, so with Terraform, you get one command to create update infrastructure. Um, this third bullet point's really important. So you can preview changes to infrastructure. And this is a really important difference from something like CloudFormation, which is that with something like CloudFormation, you make a change, you upload it, and you sort of have to divine you know, what CloudFormation is going to do. There's no staging area. You, you have your current state, you upload your new template, and CloudFormation goes off and does it. Um, but as that gets more and more painful as your infrastructure grows. So one thing Terraform does, which is very different, is you make your changes. You ask Terraform, what are you going to do if I asked you to do this? And it gives you a diff, just like code. It just gives you a diff for your infrastructure. Um, and that's really important um, because that enables sort of number four here which is you could use both the code, which describes how infrastructure is made, with the diffs that Terraform says it's going to do to really start treating your infrastructure like an application. Um, so I have another slide here, but I'll just mention it now, which is um, a common workflow I see as people adopt Terraform is to put Terraform's code into Git because it's just code. Um, but then with pull requests, you know, when you ask the ops team, set up Redis and set a memcache for me, then you branch, you do all the changes in the infrastructure, then you make a pull request, but then the pull request has both the code changes as well as the plan that Terraform outputs, which says that when you apply these code changes, this is exactly what Terraform is going to do. Um, and then you could therefore review both the code and review what will practically happen, merge it, apply it, and treat your infrastructure like, like an application. Um, and then for delegation, you're able to break things down into modules. And if you use Chef or Puppet, it's the same. It's like cookbooks or modules. Um, you could break things down um, so that you could have things like the core ops, apps ops relationship I talked about. So um, I'm going to skip these code slides. If you want to see uh, like these things, I'm going to skip these because if you want to see these, come to the deep dive. Um, excuse me, and you'll see a lot more than all this stuff. Skip it, skip it, skip it, skip it. Um, so this one I do want to cover though. So here's the Terraform plan. So 
This is sort of the diff format that you get when you ask Terraform to tell you what it's going to do. And you get, if, I mean, if you use Git or if you use version control, you'll recognize it looks very much like a diff. Um, and that's on purpose. So you know, it tells you it's going to add something up here. Um, it, it tells you how relationships happen. So the DNS simple record is going to get its uh, A record value from the IP address of the DigitalOcean droplet. Um, and you can see in the diff what's going to happen. Um, so plans show you sort of what will happen. A, a, a really neat feature is that plans are not like a no-op mode in Puppet. A no-op mode in Puppet says that if you were to run, given the current state of the world, uh, what would you do? But then when you run it, you know, a few seconds later, the state of the world might be different. So it's going to do something completely different. Um, Terraform plans are not like that. Terraform plans say, given the current state of the world, tell me what you're going to do, but also save that plan for me. And then when you apply it later, you could say, just do this change. Just assume that you know, no matter how the state of the world looks, this is the changes I want done. Um, and it'll only do those things. So they allow you to guarantee what's going to happen, which is pretty important with infrastructure, more so than, uh, more so than installing packages and things like that. Um, and, and so this last point, you know, prior to Terraform, you know, uh, with CloudFormation, uh, operators basically had to divine uh, the changes that are going to happen. So you, know, you got the basics with the plan with that. But another key thing that CloudFormation would do sometimes is just decide to, not decide. I mean, there, there are certain things in, in CloudFormation that says, like, if you change this thing, like if you change the AMI of an instance, it has to create, destroy the instance and create a new one. Um, that's just uh, understanding, like you're changing the base image, so it has to change. Uh, but sometimes there are certain parameters that aren't as obvious that require those uh, properties. Um, and with CloudFormation, you would apply it and sometimes just often be surprised that it's doing a destroy and recreate, which could cause downtime. And so it went from sort of routine infrastructure maintenance to sort of an a unexpected infrastructure event. Um, and you don't want to suddenly have an event when you're just just doing maintenance. Um, so the Terraform plans actually show you this. So if there's something in the plan that requires a destroy and recreate, then actually in this, uh, in this plan thing here, next in parentheses, next to one of the changes, it would say like this change specifically will require you to destroy and recreate. Um, and you could look at that and you know, it's 2 PM in the afternoon. And you look at it and you're like, oh, I don't really want to handle that right now. So you could just make the code change so that doesn't happen. And then you could tell if your whole plan is in place or if it has to do more complex changes. So that lets you uh, decide whether you want, you know, what you want to do with your infrastructure. You don't need to divine that. You don't need a senior level ops person to, to understand CloudFormation at a very deep level to safely make a change. A very junior level person could take a look, understand the change, get it reviewed very quickly, um, and make it happen. Here's the workflow I talked about. Um, I mentioned it already. And the modules we will go over later. So Terraform, that's sort of it. Zero to deploy in one command. Uh, changes very safely, uh, very predictably. Uh, it's trying to really bring more teamwork in order to, in your infrastructure. Um, and, and so the goal with Terraform is really a static state of your infrastructure. It's here's the code of what my infrastructure looked like before. Here's the code of what I want it to look like. Um, make that change happen. But it, you know, Terraform doesn't do things like auto scaling and dynamic, um, dynamic parts of infrastructure. And it also is not running all the time to check if your infrastructure is changing. So uh, the real time monitoring, real time discovery, configuration, that sort of stuff, that's where console comes in. Um, so the relationship between Terraform and console is Terraform would deploy console, um, and console does the real time stuff. So this is going to be pretty quick since I'm running out of time, but um, the high level things that console needs to do here. So console, uh, it's dense one sentence thing is service discovery, configuration, and orchestration made easy. Um, it's distributed, highly available, and multi-data center aware. Um, so practically, here are the questions that console answers. Uh, you want to know where is some service foo, such as where is the database? What's the health status of foo? So you know. Don't tell me where the database is if you know it's down. Like, just tell me where the healthy database is. Um, what's the health status of a machine, not just service? So uh, if, you, if you're still thinking about machines, you could ask that. Um, what's the list of all services and all machines, and maybe the mapping of services to machines? Um, what is the configuration of some service? So when a service comes online, you know, the application comes online, it would ask console, you know, am I in maintenance mode right now? Do, does this person, can this person use this feature right now? Um, and answers those questions. Uh, and then the last thing, is anyone else 
currently performing an operation. So, so console gives you distributed locks. So you're able to uh, lock something across your infrastructure and make sure uh, either leader elect or, or only one person could hold the lock at a time. Um, so we'll go over, again, in the deep dive, all this stuff. It's more like a preview of the deep dive. Um, Multi-data center. Watches. So the workflow with Terraform and console is really that the server is started. Terraform spins up a server, configures a server. Um, the console agent is started and joins the cluster. It's distributed. Um, then the services that are starting start, start querying console for its configuration. So like I said, uh, the web application asks if it's in maintenance mode or its configuration, starts doing that. And then once everything's online and healthy, then those servers are just available via DNS. So as you get to this modern data center where things are elastic, um, you reach this point where this is where they're able to handle failure, which is like you're just asking DNS records where services are. Um, as they become available, the DNS records return new results. And if they're not available, they don't. And your, your application needs to handle that. But uh, console's really the one dealing with things coming in and out, things configuring in a real-time distributed manner. Uh, and console itself could be is very, very resilient to, uh, to change. And so uh, operational bullet points that are important to understand that might pique your interest about console um, is that it is fully distributed. Uh, in terms of cap, uh, it's, it's consistent and available, but, but sort of not partition tolerant. So um, leader election via raft. Um, it, it, this is a very, so this is what makes it complicated, is it uses a gossip protocol to do um, basic health checking. Uh, so this makes it complicated because the gossip protocol is actually AP, um, and the, uh, the, the, the console side is actually CA. So you get these weird multi, depending what feature you're using on a console, you have different guarantees. Um, there's three consistency modes. So uh, console is distributed, but it's not eventually consistent. Um, it's strictly uh, consistent. So you get no consistency problems with console or anything. When you write, when you read, you're going to get the new value. That, it has, it has that guarantee in it. Um, but you can relax that constraint if you want to. So you're able to say, I, it's OK if this value is stale. And that lets you ask a non-server. This actually makes it slightly more partition tolerant if you want. You know, if there's a partition and you say, I, I know there's a partition I can't write, but uh, just give me, a val give me the last value you knew, even though it might be out of date, um, you're able to do that. Um, encryption ACLs are available across all traffic. So if security is very important for you for something like this, um, it's got to got to handle, um, and sort of real world usage right now. Um, the sort of cool statistic we're able to say about console is um, is half of all North American internet traffic goes through a machine that's running console. Um, it's it's on a lot of servers. Uh, it's on it's our biggest user is in 22 data or one biggest user is in 22 data centers um, with around 900 servers per data center, um, and they've. It's a top 50 website, and they've not once hit an issue with console, sort of knock on wood. Um, but um, so that, that those numbers are impressive and things like that. The reason I'm saying them is that the, there's, we have case studies we could show you. There's real world usage of very, very large scale to make basically every aspect of console we have quite scalable. Um, and those are it. So if you want to learn more, thank you. If you want to learn more, come into the deep dive, and we're going to actually set up, uh, set up a console cluster with Terraform um, and deploy a web application and kind of go through the whole process and features of each thing uh, all in one. So thank you. Uh, so we've got one question for you on Twitter, and maybe you have other question. I'm not completely sure what it means, but I'm sure you will. Okay. So any plan for Terraform to be able to generate a TF state from an existing infrastructure which hasn't been created? Yep. OK, okay. so the question, yeah, in a less Terraform specific way, the question is, uh, can, is there plans for Terraform to be able to import existing infrastructure? So um, starting from scratch is very easy with Terraform right now. but. If you have an existing infrastructure, it's a little bit trickier. Um, so there's plans to, but it's not yet possible. And also, um, the I already have it done, but because our AWS support isn't as good as CloudFormation right now, it's getting very close now. Um, but uh, I actually have a one command CloudFormation to Terraform configure, uh, migrator. So if you just wanted to try it, uh, that'll come out too, where you can just pipe things together and see it, see it work or not. Is there other question in the? Uh, yeah. So. Terraform, yeah, so Terraform basically, the goal of Terraform is to take um, 
in a very conceptual way, is to take each thing it's managing, whether it's a real server or a software as a service, is to take each thing it's managing and get it to a healthy state or a running state. So the definition of what that might mean for you could change. So for some people, that just means the server just physically is running. And for other people, it means that the server is running, but also the web application is ready to serve requests. Um, and you're able to make these distinctions using provisioners with Terraform. So you're able to specify a provisioner, uh, which could be local exec, like execute something locally, or remote exec, execute something remotely. Um, and Terraform will not consider the full thing it's managing as ready uh, until all the provisioners return. So you could have the local or remote provisioner just hang, you know, waiting for something to be ready. Uh, and that'll control what you want. So uh, to answer your question very specifically, like I think Terraform's responsibility should be to start the service. Uh, but it might, in this world that things are very elastic and distributed, it might not necessarily be ready until later. So console should be the one who determines is it healthy and ready to serve requests. But Terraform should be the one that does the initial bootstrapping to start it. Um, uh, and that's not to say it should replace Chef or Puppet. If, if you use Chef or Puppet, Terraform should be the one kicking off Chef or Puppet. You know, it, it's Terraform solving the issue of Chef and Puppet's great once you have the server, but how do you get the server and how do you install Chef and how do you bootstrap like the configure? How do you point it to the right Chef server and things like that? Like that's what Terraform's solving. Then there's the middle configuration step, which Terraform could certainly do, um, and then console picks up to to serve to do the discovery and serve requests. Another question, and the, it will be the last one. If you have other questions, you can tweet directly uh, Michel and or go to his workshop this afternoon. Yeah. So the question is, what's the best mode for provisioning a server with Terraform? Use remote exec with shell script, or use a CM or other? Oh, OK. Um, so you should just use what you're, you're already using something. There's some way that your servers are being set up. So the easiest way to get started with Terraform is to continue using whatever you're using. So if you're using Chef or Puppet, then use remote exec to kick those off. Um, or if it's Ansible, you know, it's a local exec to kick that off. Um, but just do whatever you're doing uh, and, and only change things as you need to. But if you're getting started from nothing, um, the easiest way is just to use remote exec with shell scripts. Uh, it's not very scalable as time goes on. It's scalable in terms of people. Like, uh, you know, configuration management has showed us for years that shell scripts aren't teamwork scalable. So over time, that, that'll hurt. But to get started really quickly, that's the best way. Okay, well done. Thank you Thank very you. much, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you.